Uh, both of our presenters tonight uh, are longtime board members of the Cleveland Police Historical Society. Uh, Dr. James Bedell, James Justin Bedell, is an associate professor of English and journalism at Tri-C East, and has written extensively on unsolved crimes in Cleveland, including tonight's In the Wake of the Butcher and Murder Has No Tongue about the torso murders, as well as Twilight of Innocence about the 1951 disappearance of Beverly Potts. He's also hosted the award-winning award -winning PBS series Doris O'Donnell of Cleveland and is about to release a book on the 1908 Collinwood School Fire. <coughs> Mark Waitstone is an independent Cleveland filmmaker and holder of four Emmy Awards for his work at WBIZ and for producing the regional series Doris O'Donnell of Cleveland. His company, StoryWorks.tv, creates true crime documentaries like The 14th Victim, uh, Elliot Nestle and Torso Murderers, as well as Dusk and Shadow, The Mystery of Beverly Potts, which won an Emmy for music composition. In 2016, Stone was nominated for an Emmy for producing a PBS documentary about Ohio author Jim Tully, and most recently produced Eddie Joss Revealed for Fox Sports Ohio. He is currently developing a podcast called True Crime Cleveland. My name is Mark Wayne Stone. I'm a board member with the Cleveland Police Museum, as is Dr. Bedell. And tonight, uh, what we'd like to do is, first of all, show you uh, a real short bit about what Cleveland was like in 1935 before the torso murder uh, started his, uh, his quest to terrify Cleveland. Uh, and then uh, we will, uh, I'll introduce you to Dr. Bedell and he'll give you his patented trademark slideshow on the, on the killings, about 20 minutes long. It's amazing, you'll be engrossed. When he is done, we'll show you a short video uh, clip from the documentary I did uh, about who we think the suspect is. Well, we actually know who he is. There was a demand. People wanted a drink, and uh, they say you can't legislate morals. There were tons of nightclubs around Cleveland. I'm sure Cleveland was just a little Chicago. There were uh, what could have been defined uh, as serial killers within the ranks of organized crime, but for the most part, I think they learned that killing was not a good idea, and uh, generally speaking, they tried to refrain from it. If there was a reason somebody had to be killed, then, then they did it. My grandfather was killed in 1932. Four out of the seven brothers were killed in uh, three different incidents. The Irish mob was always on the west side, and these people were involved with gambling. This was a steel town. Everybody gambles in a steel town. They, this is how everybody has their own home brew in the basement. For most of the big cities in the country, there, there was widespread corruption in uh, law enforcement agencies and units of government and the, uh, uh, courts, uh, just everywhere. Uh, organized crime families started becoming more modernized uh, in the 19th uh, 30s, you started seeing more cooperation. They realized that there had to be less, much less fighting, infighting amongst, amongst them because it created too much, uh, too much publicity and brought too much heat from the police. The way it is, the cops are making nothing. This is before World War II, and you had these old time cops, and they knew their precincts, and you had all these people embedded. I mean, when I say embedded, I mean embedded. I mean, they're still embedded today. So you put all those things together and the situation was very ripe for organized crime figures to approach uh, law enforcement and political figures, city officials, uh, government officials, and they asked them to maybe look the other way. It'd be a tough thing to break because these guys had it pretty good. They were making uh, a, lot, a lot of dough on the side. They had to get so many raids. So they raid the guys on a Saturday night, Monday morning, they're appear before the judges, and fine and bucks and let them go. It was, it was just uh, production justice. Louis B. Sauce, together with the best group salad, was really the kingmaker at Cleveland. He always had a hand in who was going to be mayor, and there was always a kind of a um, silk stocking crowd. So Louis Selzer got in his high horse, and a lot of the uh, well-known law firms were behind this movement to get a reform mayor and to clean up this town. And so this group selected Harold Burton 
and he was a Republican, a very high quality guy, and he became mayor of Cleveland. It was going to be, you know, really pure, and, and, and it just never happens that way. But when Mayor Burton asked Elliot to serve as safety director, he probably did have sort of a sense of youthful optimism, maybe, that uh, others might feel jaded about, but he had the confidence to know that he could make a difference in Cleveland. But even for those local officers that would have been assisting him and cooperating with him, uh, it's a little bit difficult for some uh, some guys to go after their own go after their own kind. But that's what had to be done. And, uh, eventually, he was able to do it. In the beginning, I'm sure uh, Mr. Ness probably wasn't quite sure who he could trust. So that's what the the tapestry was when Ness came in. What is known as the Torso Murders in Cleveland started in September of 1934, but no one knew then it was the beginning of anything. It was simply an isolated murder, very terrible and very strange. A man who lived in Beulah Park was walking along the shores of Lake Erie looking for driftwood to burn. This was, after all, the Depression. And he saw what he had first thought was a tree trunk with the bark stripped off. When he got closer, he realized it was the lower half of a woman's torso, thighs still attached, but amputated at the knees. Uh, the police put out a search all along the shores of Lake Erie. Didn't find very much. In fact, I think that cover on the beach is probably over one of the arms. And every time I show this particular slide, I can't help but comment. Would you look at those two cops? Could central casting have done a better job? <laughs> Too many stops at the donut stand, I would say. Oh, no. <laughs> no one was ever arrested for the crime. The woman was never even identified. She was simply called the Lady of the Lake. This photograph was taken at the old Cuyahoga County Morgue. And I can understand the broom and the bucket, but what is a lawnmower doing in the morgue? <laughs> it would be another year before the case began officially, and then it would be in the infamous Kingsbury Run. I've often asked exactly what Kingsbury Run is, where it is. It's a prehistoric riverbed attached to the flats, and it swings at a southeast arc out to about East 79th or so. If you take the rapid transit downtown from the east side of Cleveland, the final leg of the journey is through Kingsbury Run. Uh, it's bordered on the north pretty much by the Woodland neighborhood, and on the south by the Broadway 55th area, Slavic Village. And as you can tell from this photograph, it's where the train tracks are. Even with the problems we have with the homeless today, it's difficult to believe that people actually lived in things like this. But during the Depression, there were six different shanty towns of various permanence in Kingsbury Run. I think I'm fairly confident in assuring you that these men are not keeping these patients as pets. <laughs> some men slept in cardboard boxes, some on piles of excelsior, some simply on the ground. And they escaped the brutality of northern winters by hopping freight trains to warmer climes in the south. In the 1930s, Kingsbury Run was a dark, dreary place filled with trash and debris. Some people even said it was haunted. This is where it would begin officially. September 23rd, 1935. What you are looking at here is the last remaining bit of East 49th as it dead ends in the Kingsbury Run. You can see parts of the city skyline to the right. 
Uh, that house, which was there when the photograph was taken, has since been torn down. Two young boys, 16-year-old Jimmy Wagner and 12-year-old Peter Castura, were throwing a softball back and forth on the edge of Kingsbury Run. When the ball rolled down into the hill, the older boy challenged the younger one to what I described as a time-honored test of teenage manhood, a race to the bottom of the hill to see who got there first. The older boy got there first. He stopped, looked around, and froze. Ran back up the hill, intercepting his friend with the announcement that he had seen a dead man in the bushes with no head. When the police arrived, this is what they found. The body of a naked white man, decapitated and emasculated. And as I said, naked except for his socks. As the police explored the area, they found the body of another man. Although he was also decapitated, also emasculated, that body had been there for quite some time, perhaps as long as three weeks. They found the heads of both men buried in the dirt, with just enough hair of one of them sticking above the surface to make sure the police would find them. The head on the right belongs with the body that you saw in the previous photograph. What amazed the police as much as the sheer brutality of the murders was the fact that Jackass Hill was an elevation of 60 feet. They decided that no one could have gotten any closer to the dump site than 100 feet by car. And yet there were no drag marks or roll marks in the grass. Whoever had done this had taken the time to carry the bodies down the slope, one at a time, lay them out, and bury the heads. No one saw a thing. The man on the right was identified as this man, 29-year-old Edward Andrassy of Fulton Avenue. He was what police in those days called a snotty punk. He had been arrested any number of times for drinking and brawling. Uh, he was known also for sleeping his drunks off in cemeteries. As nearly as anyone could tell, he had only held one reasonably steady job in his life. Uh, he had worked on and off at Old City Hospital as an orderly in the psycho ward. Interesting detail, don't you think? He lived on Fulton Avenue with his family, and when I first began researching the Kingsbury Run murders, I checked out the address. It was a vacant lot then. Now there's one of those shishi poo poo condos there, and I can't tell you how many times I've been thought of going up to the door, ringing the doorbell, and saying, Do you know who used to live here? <laughs> We now jump to January of 1936, one of those brutally cold winters we're all too familiar with in Cleveland. In the area of 20th and Central, which even back in the 30s was a pretty seedy area, a black woman was being kept awake by a barking dog. In the early morning hours, she bundled herself up against the cold went out to see what was disturbing the dog so much. She went behind a building, Hart Manufacturing, and this is what she saw. Two half bushel produce baskets covered over with burlap bags. She lifted the corner of one of the bags and saw what she thought was a ham. She went down the alley to the local butcher who was right on the corner and said she saw some hams in a basket. Well, this poor guy thought his shop had been raided, and so he ran back behind Hart Manufacturing, reached into the, one of the baskets, and to his horror pulled out a human arm. When the police arrived, this is what they found. 
approximately one half of a woman's torso, neatly bisected, wrapped in old newspaper, packed in these half bushel produce baskets, and covered over with burlap bags. From this photograph, you can see why the poor woman thought she had seen hams. The coroner decided that the woman had been dead for about two or three days. And the cause of death, as in the case of Edward Andrassy, actually had been decapitation. She was identified through her fingerprints as this woman, Flo Palillo. She was a part-time waitress, part-time barmaid, part-time prostitute. And since this was the Depression, she obviously led a rather difficult life. It's hard to believe from this photograph, which is her police mugshot, but when she was murdered, she was only 41 years old. As the summer of 1936 rolled around, the city fathers in Cleveland had reason to be optimistic about the city's economic future. First of all, the Republican National Convention was going to be here. Secondly, a Great Lakes Exposition was opening up on the shores of Lake Erie, which they thought would bring thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of visitors to Cleveland. And at the end of the summer, the American Legion was going to be here. The last thing city fathers wanted was negative publicity nationally about Cleveland. Unfortunately, they didn't get their wish. June 1936, two young African-American boys, ages 11 and 13, were crossing Kingsbury Run in the area of East 55th Street Bridge. Legend says they were going to school. They weren't, they were playing hockey. They were going fishing. And although I have no idea where one would have fished in those days down there, that's what their intention was. They came to a tree rather like this one, saw a pair of pants rolled up underneath, looked at each other and smiled, thinking, ah, uh ah, -uh, money in the pockets. So one boy tentatively poked the pants with his fishing pole, they very slowly unrolled to reveal this. The two terrified boys ran home and hid until one of their mothers came home. And considering this was 8.30 in the morning and the mother didn't come home till 4.30, you can imagine the day they put in. They were so traumatized that initially they couldn't take the police back to the spot where they'd made this grisly discovery. The police found the body the next day, naked, decapitated, quite literally dumped in front of the Nickel Plate Railroad Police Building. They thought they had a pretty good chance of identifying him because they were able to get a good set of prints. <coughs> Unfortunately, they weren't on file with any agency federal, state, local, anything. But they still thought they had a pretty good chance of identifying him. Because the man had six different tattoos on various parts of his body. Uh, these were sent all over the country to various tattoo artists. No one recognized the work. To this day, he simply remains known as victim number four. July 1936, a young girl was walking through a wooded area on the near west side near Clinton Road in Big Creek when she came upon the naked decapitated body of a man lying on his chest. He'd been there for about a month and if you look at the thigh, excuse me, if you look at his calves, you can see there were soft tissue decomposition. His head was found piled on his clothes nearby. And even though the body was in a pretty bad state of decomposition, the police took a set of fingerprints just in case. But the body was too far gone. 
September 1936. This is East 37th. It's the only street which crosses Kingsbury Run without the use of a bridge. About September 9th or 10th, a uh, transit was running along the railroad tracks, getting ready to hop a train to the south. When he passed a murky, fetid pool and saw part of the human torso floating in the waters. This press photograph shows you the nature of the police search. This plain dealer photograph shows you its sheer scope. Uh, there have been six very grisly murders in the area of Kingsbury Run, all within about a year. And the police still had no clues. The people who lived on the south side of Kingsbury Run and the north side were panicked. This is all they were able to find in that pool. They even tried draining it. Police found a bloody shirt wrapped in an old newspaper, which they turned over to this man, David Cowles. Today we would say he was head of CSI Cleveland. <laughs> One of Elliot Ness's most trusted associates. Now, in the summer of 1936, a number of things related to the case <coughs> took place. First of all, this man, Elliot Ness, was put on the case full-time by the city's mayor. Ness had come to Cleveland in September of, th excuse me, December of 36, and he kept fairly removed from the torso murders initially, and I think that was a very deliberate decision on his part, because I think he realized this was something beyond his experience. He was used to people who committed crimes for understandable reasons. Greed, jealousy, anger. The thought he might be dealing with somebody who was killing people he didn't even know for his own unfathomable reasons never occurred to him. One of the other developments of the summer of 36, these two men were put on the case full time. The man on the left of the white hat is Detective Peter Murrow. He had the best arrest record in the Cleveland Police Department. When the chief of police put him on the case, he said, if you can't solve it, nobody can. The man on his right was his partner, Martin Zalewski. Here they are looking for clues in the hobo jungles of Kingsbury Run. Have you ever seen such a mess? The other major development occurred in November of 1936. Cleveland got a new coroner, Dr. Sam Gerber, who remained coroner in Cleveland for the next 50 years. <laughs> February 1937, this man's name was Robert Smith. He was walking along the shores of Lake Erie near Beulah Park Again, looking for driftwood he could burn. He saw what he initially identified as the body of a dead sheep or a dead dog. And the fact that he thought it might be a sheep says something about the laws about keeping farm animals in the city back then. What he found was this. The upper part of a woman's torso, decapitated, arms removed. For the first time in the cycle, the cause of death had not been decapitation. When her head was removed, her heart had already stopped beating. Three months later, the lower part of her torso floated ashore at about East 30th. And I think what we're looking at here is Coroner Gerber's attempt to match the lower half with the upper half that was discovered three months before. Uh, if you look at the upper right-hand corner of the photograph, you'll see what look like tubes. I think they're the fingers of Gerber's rubber gloves. 
The woman was never identified. June 1937. The little boy down the corner is 14-year-old Russell Lauer. He lived on Scranton Avenue in my neighborhood, Tremont. He was walking home from a movie one night when he walked under the rain, Carnegie Bridge, and he saw something glittering in the evening sun. When he got close to it, he realized it was the bridge work in a human skull. When the police arrived, they found the skeletal remains, most of the skeletal remains, of a petite black woman in a burlap bag. There really wasn't much left of her when they found her. She was later identified as Rose Wallace of Scoville Avenue. She disappeared about the time Gerber estimated the woman had been killed. She hadn't been seen since. And a young black man walked into the police station and said, may I see the bridge work that you found with that victim? And when he saw it, he said, that's my mother. That's Rose Walls. We now jump to July 1937. There were labor troubles in the flats that summer. And the National Guard had been called to keep order. This is the old West Third Bridge. If you look up into the left-hand corner, you can see the terminal. A young guardsman had walked out on the bridge to watch a tugboat go by underneath. In the wake of the tugboat, he saw what he thought at first was a store mannequin, or a piece of it. It turned out to be the first part of victim number eight. Excuse me, nine. Over the next week, the National Guard helped the police search the Cuyahoga. They were real big on people pointing at things back in those days. <laughs> Over the next week, they found almost the entire body, everything except the head. And this next photograph, judging by the date, documents what they were able to find on the first day of the search. There was a new level of the sheer butchery of the butcher's work. There were deep gashes in both thighs. The chest had been opened with a single stroke of the knife, and the heart ripped out with his bare hands. He was maybe 40 to 45 years old. He was never identified. In August of 1937, a young man was walking down along the Cuyahoga going to visit a friend who lived in a shack. He passed by a storm drain and saw what he thought at first was the body of a dead fish. It was the lower part of a woman's calf, the first part of victim number 10. A month later, the police pulled two burlap bags out of the Cuyahoga containing most of the rest of the torso and both legs. For the first time, the coroner discovered drugs in the body, and he said these are either the drugs the killer uses to immobilize his victim, or maybe the woman was an addict. We'll know that when we find the arms. Well, they never did. This is about all they ever found. She was somewhere in her mid-twenties, and again, she was never identified. We jump now to August of 1938. These three gentlemen were scrap dealers. They were looking for usable scrap that they could sell at a dump at the corner of East Ninth and Lakeshore. They found a man's double blue double-breasted blue blazer wrapped in an old quilt. Wrapped in the middle of these two, they discovered the torso and the arms and both legs of a woman. And although this photograph is not marked, I 
think what we're looking at as is Detective Peter Merlow looking at the head of what became victim number 11. He was notorious for wearing straw hats during the summer and felt hats during the winter. As they were looking for parts of the body, people standing in the area began to notice a terrible odor coming from a different part of the drunk dump site. A couple pieces of metal were pulled aside and they found the skeletal remains of another victim, victim number 12. What you're looking at here, the man on the left is Sergeant James Hogan, the head of homicide. Below him is the skull of victim number 12, which he discovered in an old coffee can. He ordered his men to round up as many of the bones as they could find. Coroner Gerber himself even participated in this grisly cleanup operation. Both victims were somewhere in their 40s. Neither one was ever identified. To show you the lengths the police were willing to go to to try to solve the case, this is the quilt that the body of victim number 411 had been wrapped in. They published it in the newspapers hoping somebody would recognize it. And believe it or not, somebody did. They traced it here to the Scoville Rag and Paper Company. But that discovery raised as many questions as it solved. Why would the murderer risk detection stealing this very recognizable quilt from the loading dock of the Scoville Rag and Paper Company when any old blanket would have served his purpose? And it is at this point, August 1938, that the murders came to an end, technically. And up until recently, the identity of the murder has been unknown. A legend grew out of the case that Elliot Ness really knew who did it, but was unable to prove it. Someone that was brought to his attention by some of his associates, and that for reasons which were not entirely clear, this suspect was rounded up and interrogated in secret and was given a lie detector test, which this individual supposedly plumped. And David Cowles said, we had a suspect in those murders. They took him to the old Cleveland Hotel, which is now the Renaissance. And Cowles said they kept him in a hotel room and they interrogated him eight hours a day over a 10 day period. It's very clear that that man in the hotel room was Dr. Frank Sweeney. Well, who was F.E. Sweeney? Well, F.E. Sweeney was Dr. Frank Edward Sweeney. He had lapsed into drug addiction and alcoholism. He had gone to medical school and come back to Cleveland and was a resident or an intern, I've forgotten which, at St. Alexis Hospital in the Broadway 55th area, the Jackass Hill area. Frank Sweeney's wife um, took him to court to have his sanity questioned. And I guess he was judged an alcoholic at the time, and he was sent to Old City Hospital for a month of observation. Exactly when this mental illness started is a little bit difficult to say. He was apparently a paranoid schizophrenic. And he had paranoid schizophrenia compounded with alcoholism and drug abuse. And so this legend persisted for years that Elliot Ness had had this secret suspect that he had given the lie detector test to and this man had flunked it. Ness had called one, called in one of his markers from his Chicago days. And Leonard Keeler himself, the man who had invented the modern polygraph, brought his in secret to Cleveland, conducted the test himself. Supposedly when the test was over, he looked at Ness and said, that's your man. I might as well throw my machine out of the window if I say anything different. And all the evidence seems to clearly show that 
Frank Sweeney was indeed Elliot Ness's secret suspect. All right, we're, we're open for uh, questions and answers. Uh, we'll, we hopefully have some answers for you, yes. Yeah, first of all, where was the city hospital at? It's uh, Metro General. Yeah. Same place. Yeah. Why did he stop killing? Why did he stop, stop killing? killing? Uh, I think it got a little bit too hot for him. Uh, Elliot Ness burned the shanty towns in the summer of 38. And shortly after that, he committed himself to the Sandusky Soldiers and Sailors Home. And after that, he was shipped around. He was a World War I veteran. He'd been a medic during World War I. And he was shipped around to various uh, VA facilities. He wound up in the uh, VA facility in Dayton, Ohio, which is where he died in 1964. And you have to remember also that uh, victims nine, uh, 11 and 12 were found uh, out on the, the lakefront, really, but uh, both of their bodies were within view of Elliot Ness's office window. And you can imagine that that just sent him Send him up and turn left. You know? Frank Sweeney knew he was a suspect, and putting these bodies under Elliot Ness's window was the ultimate. <laughs> that's right. And, and what happened right after that is that's when Elliot Ness went went down and and burned down all of these six shanty towns, uh, and very shortly after Frank Sweeney left town, as Jim said. Well, because he had no potential victims? Is that where he was getting them from? They, they originally thought that most of his victims were taken from the six shanty towns and that you know, no one would miss them and they were transients. Although they weren't hobos and you know, bums or anything, the, there were some there, but most of them were the working poor, the depression poor who couldn't afford a home, but uh, you know, worked for just enough to have a cardboard box on the flats. I once talked to a man who delivered papers in the shanty towns. Oh and he said a lot of the people who lived down there had jobs, they just couldn't afford to live anywhere else. Oh, yes. So they actually felt this was a person that was responsible for all this. And just to me, we always go through, at least not back in those days, that you had some kind of mental illness he should have been held accountable. Why was he not held accountable? They really didn't no have any evidence. Had no evidence, except the lie detector test, which of course was, that would be unadmissible today. It was certainly unadmissible back then. Okay. Yes. In a couple of the murders, you mentioned that they were read to newspaper. Could they get fingerprints off of that? They tried, but no. Okay. Sir. Uh, so there were other torso killings in other places. Uh, there was the Newcastle, Pennsylvania, where they found some torsos. Jim wrote about that. Yeah, totally unrelated. You think they're unrelated? Unrelated. Uh, and, and Sweeney, was, was he locked up when those happened? Uh, the Pennsylvania murders, I wrote a book about them, uh, took place in the 20s and then in the early 40s. Uh, Newcastle, Pennsylvania is equidistant between Pittsburgh and Youngstown, which were both pretty heavy gang cities back then. And the guess is a lot of those victims were uh, gang killings. For one thing, they were hidden. Uh, the Cleveland Torso Killer made no attempt to hide anything. Uh, the fact that some of these victims were found in Pennsylvania was simply by accident. <coughs> Yes. It seemed like, as much as I followed, they most of the murders were during the summertime. Was that correct? Is that no. Uh, victim number seven was during the winter. Uh, yeah, you're right about the others, yeah. though. You, you're right that it would probably be would have been easier. <coughs> yes, sir. Wasn't there another suspect they had? If if you're referring to Frank Dolezal, yeah, absolutely. another Frank. Um, Jim, why don't you take that one? Frank Dolezal was arrested by the uh, county sheriff. He had lived with victim number three, Flo Palillo. And the sheriff arrested him, 
supposedly he confessed to her murder. The confession didn't hold up, so he obligingly offered another one. That didn't hold up either. <laughs> so he offered up a third one. That didn't hold up. Uh, before he could go on trial, he was found hanging in his cell, a supposed suicide. Problem was, he was five feet seven and he hanged himself from a hook that was five feet five off the ground. Not impossible, but a neat trick. Uh, anyone who knows anything about the Kingsbury Run murders is pretty sure that Frank Dolezal is simply the victim of a very frightened city, desperately in need of a scapegoat. Ma'am. Was Dr. Sweeney a surgeon? Yes. Sir. How old was he? How old was he when he did his last How old was Sweeney? Uh, when was he born? Uh, he was born in 1894. Uh, he went to Western Reserve Pharmacology School in the early 20s. And of course, a friend of mine pointed out to me, of course you'd go to pharmacology school. You'd have that access to alcohol. Uh, Time out for a story if you'd like one. I got an email about three years ago from a woman who said, my husband and I were watching a repeat of a Criminal Minds episode. It took place in Cleveland. They talked about the Kingsbury Run murders. I had no idea what they were, so I looked them up online was horrified to find out how terrible they were, and really horrified to find out that the main suspect is my great uncle. Uh, she was the daughter of one of Frank Sweeney's nieces. And the niece was still living at the time. She remembered him. Uh, she, was, she was aware of all the suspicion that uh, flew around him. Uh, I will not tell you her name because she had a rather prestigious position in Cleveland. And she, of course, she was very worried about her reputation. Uh, her daughter said, mother wants to meet you. And I thought, oh God. <laughs> uh, and at that point, she was living uh, in assisted living. She was quite elderly. And she had two rather serious childhood accidents when she was uh, young. And Uncle Frank had been summoned to take care of her and he had done a really good job. Uh, but she did admit that there was something about him that was a little off. And she said, I want to read your book. And I thought, oh no, please, please, you don't want to read my book. She said, yes, I do. So I sent a copy to her son, who passed it on to her. I get an email from the daughter saying, Mom wants to take you to lunch. <laughs> and of course, my thought is, I hope there are other people coming. <laughs> uh, we had lunch together. I sat beside her, and she said, I thought your book was very well written. I said, thank you. And she said, no one could read this, including me, and not come to the conclusion that he did it. And I thought, what an incredibly generous thing to say. Uh, she has since died. And, and when, it, when people ask about Frank Sweeney, we always uh, say, I mean, like Elliot Ness, we've got no firm evidence, but we do say that everything points towards Frank Sweeney and nothing points away from him. Now, that's not, that's not guilt. But that is as close as you can get to it. Yes, sir. Is it true that uh, Sweeney sent Ness letters for years afterwards? At, oh, yeah. At the Western Reserve <laughs> Historical Society, there's a whole uh, scrapbook that belonged to Elliot Ness and belonged to his wife. And yes, indeed, he kept sending postcards well into the 1950s. When he was in the uh, Dayton facility. Scared uh, his wife terribly. There's a photograph of one of them in my. Uh, in my book. Uh, he put his name on two of them. Oh, F.E. Sweeney, M.D. 
Uh, but MD also meant for him mental defect, mental defective. <laughs> He's a funny guy. As close as he came to admitting that he did it, uh, one of the cards said, good cheer, the American Sweeney. Well, who's the American Sweeney? Him. But what does he mean by the American Sweeney? Well, we decided it was a backhanded reference to Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. He had a sense of humor that uh, the police did not find the music. Did he practice as a surgeon? Did he practice as a surgeon? Yes. Uh, yes, he did. Yes, he practiced at St. Alexis Hospital. Uh, of course, the big question is what happened to him. Uh, we've got the five postcards he sent to Ness, plus a couple of letters that he had written. Uh, I gave them to my uncle, who was a practicing psychiatrist and said, what am I dealing with, or what are we dealing with? And, of course, he didn't want to make comments about somebody you couldn't put on the couch. But I was his nephew, and he liked me, so... <laughs> he said, based on this, I'd say paranoid schizophrenia. Probably also manic depressive disorder. And I said, but come on, the man went to med school and practiced for a while. I thought schizophrenia manifested itself when you were a teen. And he said, most of the time it does, but later in life is not unknown. And he said, he probably experienced the onset of schizophrenia the way you and I would experience the onset of a cold or the flu. You know, something's wrong, it's just not sure what it is. And he would try to control the symptoms with ever-increasing doses of alcohol. And one thing that Mark and I both learned from the great niece and the great nephew was that alcoholism ran in the family. Uh, so did mental illness. And it was as if great uncle Frank became the repository of every bad gene in the family. And later on when he was in, he was in uh, institutions, uh, the administrators would complain bitterly to him, to the state of Ohio, please take his medical license away. He keeps giving drugs to our other patients. <laughs> and to himself. They, they actually did take it away like a couple months before he died, was it? Something? No, a week. A week before he died. Let's hear it for... Oversight. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they, they took his lessons away a week before he died. There were some questions in back. There was just the one victim we found that, that they found that had drugs in it. Time um, out for another story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it, very likely there was alcohol involved. Uh, there was a man by the name of Emil Froenick. This was maybe in the winter of 34. Uh, he was a hobo. He was walking up Broadway. And he suddenly found himself in a doctor's office with no thought of how he got there. Uh, this is a story he told in 1938, by the way. And the doctor said, are you hungry? Gave him some food. Uh, as he was eating it, he began to feel woozy. Felt he'd been drugged. Ran down out into the street with the doctor chasing him. Uh, ran down into Kingsbury Rum, hid out in a boxcar, and woke up three days later, very messy, very filthy, uh, and decided Cleveland was not the city for him, so he left and went to Chicago. But his story got back to uh, Cleveland police, and so they went to Chicago, picked him up, and brought him back. And he told this story. The problem was, he said, he thought the doctor's office was on the north side of Broadway. Well, it wasn't. There was nothing there but uh, storefronts. This is why I wrote a new edition of the book in 2014. Uh, a man came to one of my talks, handed me a photograph, two photographs as a matter of fact. Uh, one photograph showed this house at the corner of 55th and Broadway. No, excuse me, uh, Broadway and Pershing, which had originally belonged to a doctor by the name of Paterka. 
uh, belonged to his parents. When the parents moved out, he took over the house, converted the bottom floor to a medical facility, and kept the top floor as a living quarters for anybody who, and he has five partners. Guess who one of them was? Dr. Sweeney. Uh, I think what happened to Emil Fronick is there was also a deli right next to the house. I think Fronick went behind the deli to see if he could find some food in the garbage can and wound up going into the back door of the house, which would have taken him right up to the second floor where Sweeney was probably staying and there was a functioning kitchen up there. The, uh Answer your question, though. Yeah, it's very possible that drugs were used through, throughout, but we didn't. They weren't really testing for that. Or they weren't looking for that, and easily it could be slept, slipped into a drink or slipped into food. <coughs> yes. Sir. Was there? Did they ever find the location or locations that he committed these actual murders? It's got to be a lot of blood. That's a tough one. With these well. Guess what was standing right next door to this house where the medical practice was? The Laos Funeral Home. And David Cowell said that Sweeney had some sort of agreement with the Rouses that he could go over there. And I should add that the Rouses had a contract with the city to take care of the indigent and the unclaimed dead. And Frank Sweeney apparently enjoyed some sort of privilege where he could go over and practice surgical techniques on bodies that were not claimed. So there wouldn't be a more perfect place to uh, drain the courses. Um, yes, sir. Uh, so, so if they... I'm sorry. Is that okay? No, that's okay. Go ahead. Cool. So if they knew this was a person who had perpetrated all these crimes, but was this decided before he was diagnosed with mental illness? And should he have been held accountable at that point? Uh, he was only diagnosed as a drunk or an alcoholic in the 30s. Uh, I have never found any document that says they realized what was wrong with him beyond that. The only time he had to answer for himself was when his wife had him uh, evaluated and committed and had to spend some time in uh, a phil uh, facility where it's very possible he may have met the first victim. He may have met at Renan Rassi there because that's where Renan Rassi worked as a orderly. Okay, this gentleman. Um, so I'm gonna take it Kingsbury runs north from the east side and the west side? It r runs strictly on the east side. Oh, okay. Except for victim number five. <laughs> I think you may have answered your question. I think yes, that he, he dumped them probably in a move in moving water, so it would take it out to out into the lake. I should add that the body was found close to West 65th. Up at the end of West 65th was another office that he had. Yes, sir. Two questions about possible DNA evidence. Is there any evidence still in existence from any of these? No. Murders? No, we haven't found. Uh, at one point, we figured the files and uh, some of the things that the police department was saving were just purged. Okay, the but, second question. Any progress on getting Western Reserve Historical Society to allow you to do DNA testing on the postcards? I read about that a few years uh, back, and it was stopped, apparently, or never occurred. This was something the Cleveland Police decided they wanted to do several years ago. It was lift the stamps from the postcards that Frank Swinney had sent to this and go for a DNA sample. Western Reserve Historical Society objected strenuously because they thought this would damage the documents. And it wouldn't have, they could have lifted the stamps easily enough. Especially nowadays. But then they realized, what would that prove? Yeah, other than the fact that, that he licked the stamp. There's no evidence. Yeah, that he licked the stamp on a postcard he signed. But you know, it, it could have been that uh, 
he wasn't allowed stamps and the, the facility's nurse would have to lick it for him. So it yeah. could get all messed up. But yeah, it was really clear that, that, that he was the one. He was the singer. Um, I'm going to go with someone who hasn't. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Quick question. Did, they, did he have any children? Did, yes. Did Frank Sweeney have children? Yes. Jim, yeah. no, he yes, had. he had two. Two boys. One born in 1929 and one born in 1931. Well, we can only imagine. Uh, the one born in 1929 joined the Marine Corps and was killed at a railroad crossing in 47. Uh, Frank Sweeney's wife moved out to California at a certain point. For a while, she lived with, I think it was her brother uh, and his wife. And the other son stayed in Cleveland until he graduated high school. And then I think he went out to be with her. He might be still living. We know his name. Uh, she, she lived an incredibly long time. She didn't die until the mid-1990s. I wish I had known that. Sam, I wanted to add something, too, about the identity of, of Frank Sweeney. And this may address some of your questions about accountability. Um, one of the reasons we think that the authorities really couldn't sink their teeth into Frank Sweeney was a political sens sensitivity. And that was that Frank Sweeney, although perhaps distant, he was a first cousin of Martin L. Sweeney, who was the congressman mm -hmm. from this district at the time. Now, we don't know how uh, the city fathers and mothers and, and Martin Sweeney handled things with accusations. We believe that, that Martin Sweeney was approached that, hey, this is, your cousin is the guy. Well, uh, we think that, that things went easy on Frank Sweeney if he agreed to leave town. And indeed, he left town, and indeed the killings stopped. Uh, to add a little bit of detail to Mark's answer, there was apparently some split in the family at that point, or earlier than that. They were not particularly close. And Mark Nelswing, was having a field day charging the Republican administration of the city for being unable to catch the torso killer when June loved him in a fly on the wall. Uh, I don't think there was the typical smoky back room deal. I think it was a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, if they took Frank Sweeney to court, he would have been judged insane and sent to an institution. Why go through a trial, spare his wife, sisters, and brother, and children that embarrassment when the result would be the same? Now, I do think they got Martin Sweeney to behave himself politically, locally. Uh, the newspapers even ran articles saying, geez, what's happened to Martin Sweeney? He's been awfully quiet recently. And that's just one of those things that we, we say kind of points toward Frank Sweeney and doesn't point away. And it, you know, it's just another one of those weighty things that happen. And all of a sudden, Martin Sweeney was uh, cooperating with the Republican administration mm -hmm of the city. Oh, and he had been really hateful about Franklin Delano Roosevelt, too. And suddenly, he was on Franklin's side. They were both Democrats, but uh, um, he was he was in the, uh, what was the, the Catholic priest at the time? The Catholic minister, and Father uh, Coughlin. Coughlin. He was big into that, and Coughlin did not like FDR. So after this all transpired with, with uh, Congressman Sweeney's cousin, he was suddenly very open and friendly to all the political uh, opposition that he had courted, actually, originally. Yes, um, back there. I just had a question. Uh, you said that Elliot Knox, that was his suspect. But what made him think it was, like, why did, why did he think it was him? Why did, why did he begin to suspect Frank Sweeney? Yeah. We don't know. Uh, that's one of those things that's buried in the past. 
uh, I imagine. Uh, Elliot Ness had a group of underworld figures, people, petty thieves and that sort of thing, uh, who were paid, we think, by Louis B. Seltzer. They were called the Unknowns. Uh, they reported directly to David Cowles or to Elliot Ness. Uh, we don't know who any of them were, we just know that they existed. And we assume it was probably one of them. Yeah, I think, I think the answer is someone tipped them off. <coughs> yes, sir. Ten years ago or more, went to the Cleveland Police Museum and the heads of Parcel people were there. Are they still there? And what was the purpose? These, yes. these are plaster, plaster masks that weren't made from, uh, made from the death. They weren't actual death masks. They were just created for the 1936 ex exposition to display these victims and you know ask people as they pass by, do, do you recognize them? And and yes, they're still on display at the police museum. They're still on display. In fact, we found a fifth one, didn't we? Recently. There was a fifth mask that had been damaged somehow, and they've never put it back out on display. Okay, this young lady right here, yes. One big question we would ask Frank Sweeney if we had a chance. Did you do it? I'm going to fall over on that one. What is your drink? Uh, I don't know. If you read the postcards that he sent to Elliot Ness, or some of the letters he wrote at the same time, uh, he was obviously off in La La Land. Yeah. You would not get a straight answer, but that's a good question. Yes? Is it possible that any of this, that, that some of this was an effect from him having been in World War One, Like what they would that's call a, PTSD? That's a really good question. That, you know, yeah, that, one of the things that they noticed about the victims and the wounds was that it, they were very clean like it was a butcher or a doctor, someone who knew what they were doing, cutting at the joints. There were no hack marks. It was just... Whew. He was a medic during World War I. He was a medic, and there's no doubt that back in the days before penicillin, often you just amputated. And you better be good at it. You and better be fast. There was apparently an injury of some kind, but it was not combat-related. But it was serious enough to get him what they called in those days an adjusted compensation certificate, uh, rather like VA benefits, which when his wife divorced him, she sued for and got. I uh, called the VA, finally got his service number, called the VA in Washington, and they brought up his file. And she says, this must have been redacted somehow. Yeah. It's a very basic file, only the most significant pieces of information are here, but a lot of the information that should be here isn't. Think there, the cousin th had some help there? Pardon? Think the cousin might have helped there? I don't know. Uh, we, you know, we really can't connect them, but anything could have happened. Yes, ma'am. Was he a big, strong man? Um, yeah. Probably bigger than the average guy at the time. He could have possibly, if he's jacked up on some drug or do stuff on alcohol or something. Could have picked up another person over his shoulder, brought him down into the run or something. You know, I think I think when you have adrenaline going, I think that you are stronger than you think you are. Yes. So he was never actually held accountable for any of this. No. That's correct. Unless you say that he had to leave town, and that's. How did that happen, knowing? Um, past history and all the, I know you said I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Okay, I'm sorry. That's right. Yes. So they, so the police interrogated him for 10 days, 8 hours a day. Elliot Ness himself did, yeah. Did he have any idea of what they got from that? I mean, well, it was, the object was to keep it, the object was to keep it secret. Okay. And they, they did do that. Um, it was known to 
Ness's six associates known as the Secret Six. And one of them back in, I think the 70s or 80s, tipped his hand that there was a suspect and his name was, uh, he confirmed without saying that it was a Sweeney. Well, so this just came out 40 years ago. His identity wasn't released back in the 30s. It, it, his identity was not released back in the 30s. I would say that Sweeney's name has been out in the public for how long? Oh, 25, 30? The name first was made public back in the 70s, but it was not widely disseminated. It wasn't until the postcards showed up at the Western Reserve Historical Society that the name began to get more play locally. Do we know where Frank Sweeney was, was buried? Oh, yeah. The tor the torso. He's at Calvary the Cemetery. Oh, the, the victims? Uh, they would have ended up in probably a potter's field, unidentified, and not buried in a, uh, a vault or even a casket. Generally, they'd come up with a casket at least, but no well, vaults. It, at least one exception. Yeah. Uh, Edward Andrassy. I was contacted at one point by one of his granddaughters. And when we were talking, she said, we don't even know where he's buried. And I said, oh, I can tell you that. And she said, how would you know? And I said, there's a note at the bottom of one of the pages of the autopsy protocol. And she said, you have no idea what this means. We're the kind of family who puts flowers on graves. Uh, she called me, it was in October several years ago, we had a particularly mild October. Frank Sweeney did have a daughter. And she said, I want to bring mom up to the cemetery, can you meet us and show us where the grave is? Which I did. And when she got out of the car, I almost fainted, she looked so much like him. And she reached back and brought out some flowers. When it sort of hit me, I'm taking this woman to see her father's grave for the first time in her life. Now, did you have a, a reason for asking that? I'm just reason wondering where they were. Yeah. Anyone else? We still have time tonight. Yes? Um, I had heard, and I you know, don't know uh, why, that there was an association with the Dr. Cryo. You know, from the Cleveland Clinic, that he was a suspect or something. A Dr. Cryle? His name did come out, did. but very, very briefly, yes. Okay. And we know if, if we get a tip or find names, mm -hmm. and if very quickly something doesn't follow on, mm -hmm. keep pointing towards them, mm -hmm. they kind of recede in the background. Mm -hmm. That's why we've had so much fun, fun with Frank Sweeney. Mm -hmm. I mean, we actually think we got him. And I'm not so sure the city wants us to solve this one because it's such an attractive story. Yes, sir. Um, you hear talk that one of the reasons Elliot Ness left Cleveland was because he couldn't solve the torso murder. Well, we, we think he did solve them. He just couldn't do anything like he about could, it. Uh, you know, he, he had the reputation that he didn't solve that. There was a hit skip uh, involving drinking and someone got hit in where Elliot was driving. Later he came back to run for mayor. So yeah, we, we kind of date the downfall of Elliot Ness's career to the night he, he went down into the flats and without the city's permission burned all the uh, shanty towns. Uh, his his uh, gloss went off that night. Uh, this, in fact, the newspaper, which had been four square for anything Elliot Ness would do, Turn on. So all three newspapers did. Yes. Did they ever have any witnesses to any kind of anything to do with the murders or saw a body being placed or anything? Uh, <laughs> well, there was one woman or man who called and said, I forgot exactly how it went, but when the police showed up, they found a guy cutting up a watermelon. 
In short, really no. <laughs> yes, ma'am. When Mary Smith started the shanty town, were the people in them? Did anybody die from there? They, you know, they first went down there and evacuated everybody, and had uh, he had his officers bring them to the Wayfarer's home uh, to get, I guess we'd call it getting processed nowadays. Uh, but yeah, he waited until everyone was out. And, uh, but About a third of them had police records and were wanted. Uh, another third were so ill they were sent to area hospitals. I know there's one more question out there. <laughs> we uh, are very honored to come here tonight to your fair cities. Thank you very much for the invitation.